Do you have your eye on BU's medical school? Would you love to attend that program, but are a little nervous about the fact that it gets 80 applications for every available seat? Have no fear. BUSM's Associate Dean of Admissions is today's guest on Admission Straight Talk. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Will you be ready to apply to your dream medical schools when MCAS opens in the spring? Will you be competitive at your target programs? Accepted's med school admissions calculator can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash med quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, use the calculator at accepted.com slash med quiz, M-E-D-Q-U-I-Z, to obtain your free assessment. Now, I have a quick announcement. I'm going to introduce a new contest for podcast listeners at the end of the podcast, so stay tuned. And a thank you to Valerie Zarek of the Future Proof Your Career podcast, who left a lovely review for Admission Straight Talk. She wrote, Linda provides so much valuable information on the admissions process. I just wish this resource existed when I was younger. So glad to refer the show to anyone who has a family member going to, going to college soon, because this show answers so many questions. I would add graduate programs too, but whatever. Thanks, Valerie. Today's guest, Dr. Kristen Goodell, Associate Dean of Admissions at BU School of Medicine, earned her bachelor's degree at Colby College and her MD at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. She completed her residency in family medicine at Tufts and has been a practicing physician ever since 2007. In addition, from 2012 to 2017, Dr. Goodell served as the Director for Innovation and Medical Education at the Harvard Medical School Center for Primary Care. In 2017, she was appointed Assistant Dean of Admissions at BUSM and became Associate Dean in 2018. Dr. Goodell, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Can you start by giving us an overview of the BU School of Medicine program, focusing on its more distinctive elements? Yes. So the most important take home message to know about BU School of Medicine is that we are a social justice medical school. And so that you see that come out in a number of different ways. You see it in the types of things that we focus on in our curriculum. You see it in the patients that we take care of in our primary academic hospital. Um, And you even see it kind of in like the energy and the vibe that we bring to our work. And then you also, a big place that you see that is in the extra things that our students do in addition to studying for their classes. Um, and, and so I guess I, I could say more specific things about that. I have about 1 million stories to illustrate the fact that we're a social justice medical school. I, I guess the other thing I say sometimes oh, is- one or two. <laughs> yeah, and we're not the only social justice medical school in the United States. Like there are a few schools that I know of that I would characterize as like, look, the real reason that these schools exist is to take care of an underserved population, often a sort of specific underserved population. Um, And we are one of those schools. And it certainly differentiates us from the other schools in the Northeast. Um, And I think a thing that is really interesting about our medical school is that this, this powerful social justice driver happens in the context of a major research university. So, you know, we're not a community school that's focused on delivering care to one specific community, although we do take care of our patients in our neighborhood. But, you know, we are a, a big academic medical center and along with a, a major research university. And so what that means is that you see a lot of our areas of expertise and some of our coolest innovations are all focused around the idea of social justice. So one example um, is that we are uh, the major, we're sort of the, the primary investigative site for a large multi-center trial that is looking to um, see what happens if you screen every single patient for social determinants of health. So every patient that's seen in any of our primary care clinics is asked about their access to food, is asked about their housing situation, if they have transportation for appointments, if they need employment support, all kinds of stuff. We're doing this big study um, to see if we know about those things, would we be able to address them? And then later on, does that impact patients' health? And I think, 
you know, it's really, it seems like it should be obvious, right? Like, of course, doctors should hopefully know if their patients don't have food or a place to live. Except the thing is in medicine, we often don't know that because we don't ask. Because in medicine, we don't screen for things we can't treat. But at Boston Medical Center, which is BU School of Medicine's primary teaching hospital, we've developed all of these supports and ways to try to address those issues for patients. And so now we can do this rigorous research where we see like, okay, does it really make a difference though? We care, we know we care, but can we show that it actually impacts people's health? So that's kind of an example of how you see that social justice mission in the context of this big research medical school. Fascinating, fascinating. Now, I, I noticed in preparing for the call today that early and consistent clinical exposure throughout the early and consistent means throughout the early starting immediately and consistent throughout the four years of medical school is a critical element in the BUSM curriculum. Mm -hmm. Are students still having that exposure despite COVID? Um, how yeah, they, so they are now. Um, it took a hit. The students' clinical experiences took a hit in the springtime of 2020. Um, and that was when, you know, COVID really just sort of slammed into the United States. And right medical schools all across the country had to, felt that they had to pull medical school, uh, pull, pull medical students out of their clinical rotations for their own safety. Um, but what we were able to do was really uh, not to stop most experiences, at least not the, the core curricular experiences, but we kind of rearranged them. So for example, our first year students typically um, in their spring semester have a, a, what we call the longitudinal preceptorship where they go with a physician and they see patients in their office and in that setting, they practice their interviewing and physical diagnosis skills. Um, but, you know, they practice it with patients that are there for their care. So they have to, you know, be efficient and be goal directed and all that stuff. Now, so that was really, that normally happens in March and April and May. Um, and so what we had to do was move that from the first year spring to the second year fall. So our first year students didn't get to do it last spring, but by the summertime things had settled down and by the fall we said okay we, we have to bring these students back and so the school asked all the preceptors that normally do it in the spring hey can you take students and furthermore can you take extra students because you know we need to make sure that everybody is getting their experiences um, and so we did and it, it required some flexibility on everyone's part I mean first of all the students had to wait longer which is not what we want um, I, I took extra students in my clinic but I, I did so and said well I'm happy to have them but I don't uh, you know, some of the time I see patients is in the evening and Saturdays. So I'm happy to have students, but they, they're going to have to come on evenings and Saturdays. And so um, they did, they were happy to do that. So there was a little bit of rearranging, um, but we, we did pretty well without really reducing the core curricular um, elements that happen in the clinical setting. And August by August, everybody was back in clinic in the regular way. All of the students were. Right. And I assume now that as healthcare workers, they're, they're getting vaccinated, right? Or I don't know what the, the way it works in Massachusetts, actually. Yeah, so our students are vaccinated along with healthcare workers and, um, and, and the numbers are the vast majority of our students signed right up and said, yes, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> get out of jail free. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. I was also in preparing for the call. I noticed that at BU, there's something called extracurricular enrichment activities. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what those are? Yeah. That seemed to be pretty distinctive. Yeah. So, um, so I think what you're talking about are, um, we have a series of pretty structured kind of courses that students can take. Um, they're entirely optional. Um, a couple that I can think of that are very popular include the medical language courses. So we offer medical Spanish at several different levels. Um, the excuse me, those are actually largely facilitated by students because about 80% of our students um, speak another language in addition to English. So many of our students come in speaking Spanish and so they'll help their peers. Um, and so we, we offer one for beginners and then we offer another one for students maybe who have studied some Spanish but are not so sure about it using it in the medical setting. Sure. And then we also have a course in um, Haitian Creole that's taught by one of our faculty um, who herself is Haitian. So she leads that course. And then actually, in addition, um, a really cool course is our advocacy curriculum. And this one is also, um, it has a lot of student leadership. And it's basically a course where as a first year student, you're a participant in the course and you, it's one evening a week. And um, each session, you have a speaker that comes in to talk about something like I was invited a couple of years ago because I had testified before Congress in favor of some um, primary care funding. So 
they wanted to know, oh, can you come and tell us about what it's like if you get to do that? So they'll have a speaker come in and then they spend some time on a skills training thing, like how to write a letter to the editor or how to set up an appointment with your congressional representative, something like that. And then also along with that, the students get into small groups and they do some kind of a project, a year long project. And sometimes the project is sort of bite size one year project. Like for example, um, the year that I was there, a group of students were working to bring dental services to one of our community health centers. Um, some of our community health centers have dentists and some don't. So they spent a year getting you know, uh, don donations of equipment, um, finding people that would volunteer to staff the clinic, making sure they had all the appropriate permissions in place. And then there's always a group of students who their project is working on some form of single payer healthcare. That's our, that one keeps going year after year. And, but they'll set a goal for the year. Like, oh, we want the Massachusetts Medical Society to address this particular um, amendment or you know, something like that. Resolution is what the word I meant. So, so yeah, so that's, that's one of the examples of um, these kind of you know, extracurricular, really structured activities. And then I should say, we also have um, an enormous number of just entirely student-run groups um, the most popular thing that our students do with their time is to participate in some sort of service learning activity. There are about 17 or 18 different student-led service groups. There's a huge right. spectrum. Can you give an example? Group. Yeah, there's a huge spectrum of what you can do. You, so there's one called, um, one of the longest running ones is called the Outreach Van, which is an actual van that students, um, you know, take to different parts of the city and they bring clothes and they bring food and, you know, try to identify people that need to get to medical care. There's another one, this is one of my favorites, our neonatologists, one of their innovations is that they have um, figured out a better way to treat neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is what babies have once they're born to addicted mothers. So normally those babies go to the NICU. And so, you know, in the NICU, they're in like a little plastic isolate and they get a lot of medications to help ease them through the physical withdrawal. But what our neonatologists figured out is that you can dramatically reduce the amount of medications the babies get, but you can't leave them in a little plastic isolate. You can decrease the medications, but you have to snuggle them. So one of our service activities that students can sign up for is to get trained and then they can go into the NICU and snuggle the babies, which I'm like just about to sign up for myself because <laughs> I can't, I mean, that sounds amazing to me. I'll do it. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I but, read about that. I, I remember reading about that. Uh, yeah. Actually, what I read about was mostly retirees going in and, and snuggled, snuggling babies. Somehow there was some uh, yeah. article I read year, several years ago. Yep, absolutely. But our medical students can do it too. So, they, and the, so there, are, there are a whole bunch of different projects they do. And because they're student run, students can come in and start a new group. And then sometimes, you know, over time, the need for one will fade. Um, a lot of people ask, I mean, I'll answer this question because um, a lot of people ask, oh, you know, do you have a student run free clinic that students can work in? And the answer to that is no, because we have a free academic medical center. So, oh, so the whole thing in, is free. <laughs> basically. So in Massachusetts, Massachusetts passed a law five years before the Affordable Care Act that said right. everybody has to have insurance. And we hugely expanded Medicaid. And so 98% of the population of Massachusetts is insured, but you still gotta take care of the other 2% and they come to either our hospital system or there's Bay State in Springfield, which is a couple hours away. So um, so, so we, we don't need a free clinic because like we, we are the free clinic. <laughs> you know, right, patients right, come to us, it doesn't right. matter if they qualify for insurance, it doesn't matter if they don't have any money, you know, either we will be, get them signed up if they qualify or if they don't, we just take care of them. And that includes all their medications, all their testing, all their visits, all their whatever. That sounds like the, mm -hmm. the biggest evidence of your social justice mission. Mm -hmm. um, all right, now let's turn to the application. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I want to touch on for a minute on, on the MCAT, since you kindly shared with me that you were on the MCAT validation committee. Mm -hmm. Now, given BU's focus on serving the underserved, do you feel that the MCAT helps or hinders that mission? Any plans to go MCAT optional? I guess that's two questions. <laughs> Yeah, that's two questions. Um, so I know I don't have plans to go MCAT optional because I believe that more information about candidates is better. Um, and truthfully, the most important question that we're trying to answer with any application, well, they're, they're, uh, so the big most important question is who are you and what do you bring to the table? That's the application as a whole. 
yeah, that's like, that's all, that's really the big picture question that we're trying to figure right. out about every single applicant. And then, and then, but more specifically, one question is the, probably the most important one of all is, are you going to be able to, to manage the curriculum? And so how the MCAT helps us is it allows us to understand students' performance, particularly at institutions that we're not as familiar with. So for example, you're in California, right? Um, I had before a couple of years ago, never heard of Cal State Fullerton. I don't know, you know, well, never heard of that place. I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I don't know what kind of education it offers. I don't know if it has like small 50 person classes or 500 person classes. I don't know if anyone can go there or if it's, I don't know. So, um, but on the other, but what I do know is that a lot of people who are smart and ambitious will go to college because that's what's available to them. You know, it's inexpensive. It, yeah, it's, it's inexpensive. inexpensive. It's local. Right. Maybe they can live at home. They may have home responsibilities. Right. They need to take care of things at home. They have to help younger siblings that, you know, whatever. That doesn't make them less smart or good doctors. Of course. Um, it just means that that's what they did. But the problem is if I have the MCAT, then I can help understand the answer to the question, are they going to be able to succeed in medical school? So okay. I don't have any plans to get rid of that because I don't particularly want to fall into the trap of relying on like your school's fanciness to decide yeah. whether or not, you know, so. So then um, you're basically arguing that the MCAT actually advances the, the social justice mission. It certainly can. I mean, the other yeah. thing is part of our social justice mission is to recruit as diverse of a class as possible. And so the important thing with the MCAT is really how you use it. The most important thing is not to have strict cutoffs because mm -hmm. if you cut people off, then you are definitely going to cut some people out, you know, and and a test is not everything. So right. that's why we don't have any cutoffs. We try to, as I said, try to understand everybody in context. I think also it's how you use it. If you use it right. as evidence of somebody's academic ability, that's what it's, or, or predictive ability in terms of mm -hmm. success in medical school, that's what's intended for. Mm -hmm. If you're using it as a sign of medical school quality or quality of the student body right. or rankings factors, you got it. there's a problem. There, yes, there is a huge problem with that. And it, and it, I mean, the other, the real problem with this, people can just fudge it. You know what I mean? Like it, if you, most medical schools have way more applicants than they can accept. Right. So right. if you're trying to game the rankings system, then fine, just take the people with the highest MCAT scores and ignore the rest. But right. is that really what is going to make good doctors? No, so. no, no. And it also doesn't, it wouldn't fit with your social justice mission either. Um, do you have any advice for pre-meds about to take the MCAT? What, you know, like overall kind of advice, not test yeah. taking. So, so my overall advice would be to, um, to, to believe what the AAMC is telling people, basically. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to think, oh, they're just, they're trying to make it as hard as they can and they're trying to weed people out. The AAMC is, is not, they're trying to make a fair and valid test. And they really, really do want to make it so that people have equal access. So when they when they give you an outline for the test, for example, and say, here's what's on it, that, that really is what's on it. <laughs> so <laughs> some of the best resources are to be found on their website. Um, in general, what people need to do is they need to plan about three to six months in advance of studying. Um, people do better if they study consistently over three to six months. Um, they do better than if they try to say, okay, I'm just going to take the month of July and study the whole thing. And then it's, it doesn't work as well to do that. Um, and when you, when I say three to six months for most people, it should be about like a part-time job. So people are usually spending like hmm, between 10 and 20 hours a week on it. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, or a class. Yeah. Right. It's like a class. And I, it, uh, and I, the other thing is to, the best way to do it is to, you know, you take a practice test, you identify your strengths and weaknesses, you study up on the weaknesses. You take oh, you mean you don't study the practice. strengths more, which is more fun? <laughs> it is more fun to do that, but it will not help you that much. So, okay. yeah, so that's, you know, that's the pattern that, um, that works out best. Lots and lots of like quizzing yourself and testing yourself is what's, what's really good. Um, and yeah, you know, the, the thing is that it's your ability to do well on that test it shows mastery of the material. It also shows your ability to, you know, like set a big educational goal, like do that, like doing that consistent work like that. That's, that's kind of what we're looking for. That's true. That's true. Yeah. All right. Let's move on in the application process. Mm -hmm. The 
BU secondary application. It's a mm -hmm. thorough secondary application with three to six essays. Mm -hmm. What do you learn from the secondary that you don't get from the primary? Yeah, so we ask specific questions on the secondary. We, we give everyone a secondary application. We don't do an initial screening. And the reason is because there's information on that secondary that helps us understand who you are and what you bring to the table as an applicant. So for example, we several of our questions are not required, um, right. but we have one question that asks, that basically says, tell us whatever you want about your educational history. If there's something that didn't, if, if there's something that didn't come up in the rest of the application, use the space to tell us. And not everybody answers it. There are lots of people who've had like a relatively typical pathway and we kind of get it. Um, but on the other hand, people often use that space to tell us things that maybe they didn't want to spend their whole personal statement talking about. So perhaps somebody had a difficult semester and it was because I don't know, their parent became ill and they had to go and take care of them or they themselves right. are struggling with depression and they needed to take some time to address it. Or, um, you know, or maybe uh, we, some people say, oh, I, I didn't get a chance to explain this, but my parents were in the foreign service. And so I've actually lived in six different countries and this really informs my view of medicine because, you know, I, I have an understanding of the different way people view things. And um, so, yeah, so people tell us all kinds of different things. So sometimes People will talk about one recent really memorable applicant talked about his journey from community college to an Ivy League school to finish out his education. Um, so we ask that because we ask those questions because we, again, are really trying to be able to put all of the data about you into context. And then this year we added another question which asks specifically, which specifically relates to our mission. So I was talking about social justice. This is a question that we actually added at the suggestion of our students. So our students, um, you know, this summer said, we really, really need to work on increasing the diversity of our incoming classes. And, you know, we all say we've got the social justice mission, but we need to ask applicants about it directly. And so um, we did. So we added a question to our secondary that basically said, this is what the hospital does. Why do you think you'll be good at it? You know, why do you think you belong in this social justice mm -hmm. piece? Um, and we want to know that. And I, I will tell you that I was actually a little bit skeptical because I thought, ah, applicants are just going to tell us what they think we want to hear. They're going to read the website and they're going to figure it out. Um, but it turns out that there's a big difference between somebody who has read the website and says, yes, that's exactly what I believe too, versus somebody who's actually been living their lives like that the whole time. And you see that when you look at people's experiences. Right. Great. And it has to do with the way they write about it too. If they say, oh, this would be such a good experience for me to learn. <laughs> then it's all that. about them. That's all right. about that's me. All, exactly. That's a little bit different than yeah. uh, I would so value the opportunity to give back to this community. Or I've, I've been involved in this. Yeah. Or yeah. my goal is to serve, you know, the reason I want to be a doctor is because I grew up without these resources or I grew up in, you know, nobody spoke my language and so I want to go back to my own community and I think I can get well-trained to do that. You know, that's like that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so okay, it actually turns out it's a great question. <laughs> yes, yeah. I've had, I've had similar where, where, you know, either I added a question or took away a question and I was very surprised that the, you know, it yeah. was a pace to experiment. Yeah, yeah. How about the CASPER? What does that add to BU's evaluation process? Mm -hmm. What does it add to your insight into, the, into an applicant? Yeah, so we don't have, this is the first year that we're actually using it in admissions decision making. And we are in the process of analyzing how um, effectively Casper helps us do our job. So I don't have like hard data to share yet. The goal of Casper is that it gives us information that otherwise is very difficult to get on the application, but that almost everyone thinks is really important to be a good doctor. So most people believe that you need to have truly truly exceptional communication skills, not just, you know, not just outstanding intelligence, but you also need to have outstanding communication skills. Most people believe that you need to have incredible empathy and that you need to be an excellent team player. But those things, it's so hard to see them from the application. Um, you know, you, uh, we look at the experiences to see if people have been inclined to work in teams before, but it's hard to, to know if it's really true or if it was just kind of an accident that they were with a group of people, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's just, it's hard to pull that out of the rest of the application and that's what Casper seeks to do. So we hope that that is helping us get more more information about each candidate 
and frankly, I think that's actually the stuff that's really important. You know, as I said, we have academic information with the GPA and the MCAT. We, we, we I feel like we've got that covered. We know about your your um, academic abilities, but these other things um, would help us to know about. So that's what we're hoping. Okay, great. That's a great answer. Um, now you mentioned in, in the previous question, I wanted to ask you about it, that sometimes people's grades dip because of depression or, or a mental health issue. And I know many applicants are reluctant to attribute a dip in grades to a mental health issue or depression, anxiety, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. How do you react to that? I mean, that's something that my staff debates all the time. Yeah. And I agree that that is a difficult issue because what you want is to put your best foot forward. And I right. think most people don't think of that as being part of their best foot forward. Um, so I, I really do understand that it is um, difficult. And, I, to be, and to be completely frank, I've seen people write things on applications that I think that was a little bit too much. You know? right. so, um, so I guess I think the key thing is to just think about your audience and think about what, again, what is the thing that they're trying to assess? They're trying to make sure that you are going to do well in medical school. So, you know, somebody who has wrestled with some mental health problems, grown a lot from it, developed an enormous amount of empathy, and there's evidence that it's really in the rear view mirror and is not be a problem, mm -hmm. then great. We're good. You know, that's, that's fine. Um, people that seem to be in the midst of an ongoing struggle, I think I honestly would advise them to wait a little bit longer because you really do. Medical school is hard as it is. I yeah. think that we really are trying, you know, we're trying to support our students as much as we can. And we believe in wellness, physician wellness. But the fact of the matter is, this is not a job for people that are trying to like clock in and out at nine and five. You know, it's, it's, it's hard and it's sad sometimes. And it, so you, you really want to be in a good place where you feel like, nope, I am ready to jump right in there and pour my heart and soul into this thing. Makes sense. <laughs> now, what is the interview day at BUSM like in the time of COVID? Is it a day or is it an experience or is it an interview? I mean, what is it? Yeah. So what we did was we set up, first of all, we set up a special um, web page that's part of our application portal um, that lists, that has a whole bunch of specific resources that really are only for students who are interviewing, um, you know, which includes things like um, contact information for our current students who are admissions ambassadors. There's this living FAQ document where interviewees can go in and put in a question and then some one of our students will answer it. Um, it's entirely done without my supervision. I asked the students to do it, but I, I don't read it. I don't, so I, there's no, you don't have to worry about people trying to like feed you the institutional line or whatever. So we have, we have some, so some, some things on there that are really um, just for interviewees. But then in addition, what we have in terms of the sort of live stuff are there three required things. You have one required faculty interview. Um, you have one kind of overview info session that I do, which is live. Um, and then all virtual, you're just, but all, yeah, it's all, all virtual, virtually. but it's yeah. all real time. There's nothing recorded. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you also have a session with students. And so the session, and all of these are interactive. The session with me is interactive also. Um, but, um, you know, with lots of Q and A with students, they sort of start off with some introductory basic stuff and then they break, go into breakout rooms. So the applicants have a chance to talk in just a small little group with students. So those activities are all required. Um, but we didn't make people schedule at all in one day. Um, that was a decision that I made when we were trying to plan out the season. And it mostly was because in the late summer, um, I was feeling just about maxed out on the amount of Zoom that I was doing. And <laughs> so I thought I just, the idea, things that I do where I end up spending three hours or four hours in a row on Zoom, I, I just find them to be really tiring. I had a headache at the end. And I, I just, so I just, I didn't think that would be appealing to applicants. So I thought, nope, let's not do that. Let's make these three things required. And we're going to tell applicants, try and do them within a week of each other, try and do the intro session first. Um, and, and we'll, we'll see if it works. The risk is that students won't really remember that much, that all the stuff about BU will be a little diffuse and that they won't be able to remember it as well. But I don't know, that was the experiment of this year. Okay, I guess you'll, you'll figure it out if it worked or not. Yeah. Now, let's, let's say we get beyond COVID and we can start mm -hmm. traveling again, meeting again. 
will you return to in-person interviews? That is to be determined. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. I'm not trying to hedge. I really don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's an honest answer. It's good. It's fine. Yeah, I, I am a, I am a massive extrovert and I really like meeting people in person. So yeah. I would vastly prefer to go back to our interview days, even though they're like hard to schedule and very demanding. And like, um, I would prefer that. However, it is really expensive for applicants, Yes, especially people are flying across the country. They got to stay in a hotel. It's just, and I'm not, and, and I think the evaluative part, which is the interview, I'm not sure that we, uh, I think we're doing that actually, that part actually goes pretty well over Zoom. I don't know that that much is lost. I think what's lost having a virtual day is, is the sort of getting to hang out at the school and, you know, like just see what people act like and see how people seem to be with each other. And overhear little snippets of conversation and look at how everyone looks. And, you know, I think that is the stuff that we lose. So the question is, is there a way to do that in another way that's more efficient? So what we might do, this is my current idea, but this could be, could end up being totally wrong, but it could be that we do this. We might do is have our interview days, had, schedule the interview requirements similar to the way we do now. But then what we might do is something like have a series of visit days for accepted students so that it, and it won't be just like one big open house. Like in the past, we've had this giant open house in April and it's like a big party and, you know, we have workshops and then we have like a reception at the end of the band, um, which is awesome. By the way, we have a BMC band, which is really excellent. Okay. <laughs> but instead of that, what we might do is have like a series of, okay, eight or 10 Mondays or Fridays when people are invited to come to campus and then they can spend the day with us, you know, get a tour, have lunch with students, chit chat with faculty, maybe sit in the class, you know, we'll sort of arrange some things like that to, to, so allow, to allow them to make a decision. So it might do something like that. I am really hoping that the AAMC surveys both schools and applicants to find out what they would like. Um, because to some extent, I want schools to sort of play fair and I want to be, I want to be fair to applicants and I also want I, I don't know I want it to be fair with schools too so I think I don't know if there's a little bit that we need to we need to be aware of what everyone else is doing and we really need to know what applicants think you know what I'm saying right right do they do they miss the in person right right and and I think I think it's both and we also need to be you know we need to be particularly attentive to some of the people we most care about recruiting which is not necessarily people that have lots of money right so if you asked, I mean, when I was an applicant, I was, you know, I was living on my own, supporting myself. I did, I did not have a ton of, I don't have family money or anything like that. I borrowed all the money for all kinds of, for all of my school, but I still would have spent the money to travel to a school to go there. But I'm an extraordinary extrovert. I know I do much better in person, like making an impression. So like for me, it would have been worth it. But I don't know that that's the same for everybody. And so I don't want to disadvantage some people who are like, I just can't take time off from my two jobs and my family responsibilities to, you know, so anyway. Right. It's hard. Yeah, it's, it's a hard one. It's a tough one. It's, I think it's something that everybody's going to be grappling with in, in yeah. multiple fields. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, you continue with telemedicine. Gosh, I or hope do so. You... <laughs> that one I think is good for everybody. Okay. Um, or do doctors really need to see people? Yeah. I don't know. For some, I should, I should qualify that for some stuff okay. we do. And I actually yeah. prefer to see people in person also. So I'm only seeing people in person right now, but okay. I think like for many things, telemedicine is perfectly adequate and right. much more convenient for patients. So. Yeah, I can, I can hear that for many things. That's a hundred percent true. Yeah. All right. Now let's go back to the application. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the MSAR and in 2019-20, BUSM received a total of 9,151 applications. Mm -hmm. It had 160, yet it has 160 students who matriculated to its MD programs, the various programs. Mm -hmm. So your site and this interview have both emphasized that it's a, every application is reviewed and it's reviewed mm -hmm. holistically. Mm -hmm. So how do you win it with down from 9,151 to 160? Yeah. It, so a human reads every single application. Okay. Um, 
we do, what we do is we have a team of people that review them. Um, we have a set of criteria that we look at for every application. And we do, uh, we basically see, okay, you know, for every single application, how strong are the academics? How is the CASPER score? How um, focused is this person on service? Um, all, all different kinds of, there, you know, there are a bunch of different criteria that we look at. And so that, we, so we have a structured way that we review every application. And then we, so we go through and we review that we sort of review them in aliquots because we can't do the whole pool at once and then do the invitation. Right. Right. So we do like a chunk and then you say, all right, of that, that 50, I'm going to pick the, uh, what did we say? I think we said the top 20%. So for each aliquot that you do, you take the top 20% and say, okay, those are the people we're going to interview. Got it. Okay. So all right. Yeah. And is there, are you looking for anything differently today than maybe you looked at two or five years ago when you first started at BU or maybe when you were even at Harvard? Um, yeah, well, think, I'm thinking so, more in terms of the impact of the pandemic. Yeah, um, I don't think, not because of the impact of the pandemic. Um, the things we looked at at Harvard were a little different from the things we look at at BU. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Um, yeah, just because of the different missions of the schools. Right. Um, but um, I, I actually really think that the things we're looking at, you know, the criteria are kind of the same. I would say that this year we're more focused on mission fit. Um, a little bit. We've always been pretty focused on mission fit, but I think now we're kind of emphasizing that more. Um, you know, really wanting to get people who share our goal of, you know, solving the biggest problems for the neediest people. All right. And how do you view letters of intent or correspondence from waitlisted applicants or letters of intent before mm -hmm. interview, after interview, after waitlist? So, I'm getting tons of calls and emails and messages. I haven't heard anything. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this year, as you no doubt know, everything was slowed down by a couple right. of weeks. So um, that's probably a lot of people are still hanging out there wondering what the heck is going on. And it really is just because it's taken us longer. Um, you know, the more we had 27% increase in applications. Wow, this year. yeah, yeah. So, this took longer to read them all. But um, before interview, they don't make any difference at all. Okay. Um, for us, I mean, I don't know what other schools are doing, but we don't, we don't, don't have a pro we just review the application. Right. Um, the, for other letters of intent or updates, it, the later in the process you get, the more they matter. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you interview, I always joke, I used to joke with people when we were in person that I do want to know if you really are interested in BU. But sure. if you go outside and while you're waiting for your Uber, you're like, dear Dr. Goodell, <laughs> being this is my favorite. I'm going to be like, you're full of baloney. You haven't even seen all the places yet. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> On the other hand, if people are, you know, more towards the end of the process, they have seen all their schools and they feel really strongly about a school, then that becomes a little bit more important. But truly the only time it makes a difference is if we're your very first choice. And then, um, and then in, even then the time when it makes the most difference at all of all is if you find yourself on the wait list. So if you're on the wait list and you're thinking, ah, oh, I really wanted to go there. That is my number one school. Um, then sometimes that makes a difference if I know that. Mm -hmm. you know, we, and you do, and you're open to, mm -hmm. to wait list letters. I mean, it's not like yeah. you throw them in the trash or anything like no, that. No, no, we don't. We, I read them all actually. Okay. And really every year there are, um, you know, people who write and say, uh, this is my absolute choice. And, and even people who, the more honest and clear people can be, the better it is. People will sure. say, I have another plan. I have been accepted to another school, but if you let me in, I'm coming. And especially if you're like, I, I am accepted and so I'm going to matriculate there on, you know, August 1st. But if you let me in first, I'm coming. Then I'm like, okay, I believe you. Right. So. Right. Okay. That's yeah. good to know. Um, now this is a time of year. We're, not, we're going to leave the 2021 applicants for a moment. We're going to move ahead to 2022 applicants. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is time of year when medical school applicants are kind of gearing up, mm -hmm. right, to apply this summer. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to med school applicants thinking ahead and planning to apply either in 2021, this summer, or 2022? Um, getting close, though. So people... 
often ask me, I think the biggest question that applicants have is how can I, I mean, basically everybody wants to get in. How can I get in? And part of that is how can I make myself stand out? And then a subsidiary of that question is, is it better for me to do this or this activity? Or, you know, should I, how should I spend my time? And the most important thing is that people, is that you do what you are excited about, not what you think is going to look good. Um, there's a whole set of applications that where people have met all of the criteria. And when we read those applications, we say, what we often write in our notes is this application has kind of a checkbox feel, which means like, oh, they told me I have to do some community service. Okay. Um, all right, let me do this. I, I, let me do this this year. Yeah. You know, yeah. or whatever. So, so that doesn't play all that well. Um, but but I also get it. I don't want to like, I, I feel bad saying that because like, I understand poor applicants. They're just trying to follow the rules. You know, I get it. So it's, I, I, it's not that it's a bad thing to do, but I think what is the most important is that you do the thing that is really exciting to you because most likely there's going to be some school that thinks that is amazing. And you know what I mean? So like, good, then you apply and go to one of those schools that thinks what you did is totally amazing. Right? Yeah, like, you'll write about yeah. it with a lot more enthusiasm if you're genuinely enthusiastic about it. Exactly right. Exactly right. So, you know, as I said, like we are not the only social justice medical school in the United States, but we're looking for people that we think are going to genuinely share our passion and enthusiasm. Right. Um, so, so I think that's really important. So, and that can be for whatever the thing is. If your if your thing is you know serving the underserved, great. If you're but if your thing is like the business of medicine, and so you worked for Deloitte for a couple of years, and you you know that's good. Do that. I'm not sure that BU would be the best place for you, but you know what I mean? Like, although don't tell them the MBA, but anyway, (laughs) I point is do the thing that you're excited about. Some school is going to like it probably. So, but that's, that's my advice. Do what you love. I, I, um, this is, I've said this before on the show, but it's been a while. So I'll repeat it. Um, years ago, uh, unfortunately we had a child who was, who was quite ill. And one day we were at the clinic and there was a playroom for the children and there was a a pre-med student in there. And all he did was watch the video that was on the screen. He didn't, he didn't interact with any of the children. He didn't play with them. He didn't do anything. This was all pre COVID, you know, so, and I, I knew what he was doing and I could tell that the people running the clinic were so unimpressed with this guy. It was so obvious yeah. and I was already doing this work, you know, um, and you know, the guy it was wasting his time. Basically yeah. he was yeah. trying to get a box checked and he'd get right. it checked. Yeah. But it'd be a very little check. Yeah. And I, you know, the thing is, I also, I guess the, other, the little sort of subtlety that I would say is that it's okay to test something out and then decide that it's not really you. That's fine. And then if somebody asks you about it, you can say like, oh, that wasn't really me. That actually happens. We see that um, happens with research. Sometimes people will try to do some research and their motivations were good, but then they found like "Mm, this bench work stuff is just not really where my heart is. (laughs) Right. Right. No, that that's different. That's different. I, I, and I think it's, it's okay. I mean, you know, for people in their early twenties, even mid late twenties, a little experimentation is fine. Yep. It broadens you. It'll, mm-hmm. it'll contribute to your, exp- your uh, abilities as a physician, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. that's not the same as sitting in a play. That's not, that guy was really just checking a box. Right. If he'd been experiment, you know, he would have been playing with the kids. Right. Exactly. And you know, there are multiple different ways to contribute. Even there are multiple different ways to do community service. I mean, for example, lots of people are like, Oh, I was the philanthropy chair of my fraternity and we raised $25,000 for such and such, you know, like, okay. That you can do that without playing with children. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. What would you like me to ask you? Um, I guess I didn't think about this one in advance. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Um, Is there something you'd like to like end with or? Um, I think... I, the other little thing that I'll say is, uh, you know, I was giving advice about that people should do what they love. I think the other thing that I think is really important that people know is that there is there is not one right path. You know, 
the reason that we do this holistic review stuff, the reason that we have a human read every application is because there are an infinite number of different pathways to have a successful career in medicine. And we just don't think it's a one size fits all enterprise. And so I want people to know that it is, it's okay to make mistakes, um, that it's okay to change your mind about stuff. So you're right, I finished my residency in family medicine, but I matched into general surgery and did that for three years and then switched. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so I totally well, changed. Going back to experimentation. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, you know, there were, the, there's a, the, I, I basically, you know, I say I made a mistake. I don't, I regret it 0%. It just made me a better doctor. Um, but on the other hand, like the, re, the that happened because the reasons I picked surgery were just wrong. <laughs> it's like, oh, my mom will be extra proud if I'm a surgeon. <laughs> and like, also, um, I don't know, I was, I was trying to make a decision in a way that I don't make decisions. I was trying to like check all the pros and, and you know, not have any cons. And it, it's just not the way I actually do things. So, so I think I want people to know that, you know, you can, you can take all these different pathways um, and, and have it still be okay. Um, there are really very few non-overcomable mistakes. That's it. Okay. okay. That's a great yeah. way. That's a great note to end on. Dr. Yeah. Goodell. Except for I think... academic integrity, people should not. Okay. Cheat maintain academic integrity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Don't cheat. But cheat no, don't cheat. But if somebody makes a mistake in their freshman year, are they toast? Uh, I think it depends a lot on the school and on the situation, but it's a, okay. it is, uh, but that's a hard, that's the hardest one to overcome that I can think of. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I think we're just about out of time. I want to thank you so much for joining me and sharing your expertise and insight. This has been fascinating and delightful. I know you have a few things to take care of. Um, <laughs> where can where can listeners learn more about Boston University School of Medicine? Yep. So we have a website, and um, you know it's 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 actually from our hospital. So it's bumc.bu.edu admissions. But basically, if you Google BUSM admissions, then that's what comes up, and that's we've got all the information and some not very flattering videos of me explaining the process. <laughs> I actually saw some of them. I thought they were excellent. Okay. We're going to include links in the show notes at accept.com and it'll take you right to BUSM's website, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to you, including the med school admissions quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply when MCAS and ACOMAS open their portals again and competitive at your target schools. Take the quiz at accept.com slash med quiz today. And here's the announcement I promised at the beginning of the show. This is the thank you for your review contest. One listener a month who leaves a podcast review on Apple Podcasts, also known as iTunes, will win a free 20-minute consultation with me. You can leave your review at lovethepodcast.com slash A-S-T. I look forward to hearing from you and speaking with you. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. 